Welcome. You're watching Ask Your Father. Uh, this is a Guadalupe Media production. Uh, it is a show where we invite priests to our show to answer questions that we may have. I am your host, Vincent Palacio, and with me we have uh, Father Jordan Gangongora. Good day, Father. Welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thank you. Good day to you, Vince, and to all our viewers, our Catholic brothers and sisters. I'm very happy to be here at this program uh, for our people and for all whoever <laughs> views uh, worldwide. Of course. Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, Father, you are at the Co Cathedral in Belmopan. How long have you been there and how is that going? Uh, that's right, Vince. I've been here since August 2015. Um, and I'm already five years, going to my six years here at the Co Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Happily serving this uh, beautiful uh, parish here in Belmopan and the surrounding villages. Mm -hmm. um, I know, Father, at, uh, at the Co Cathedral, you serve uh, a, a diverse uh, congregation. You know, I, I, I visit there once in a while, and I know there's a dynamic choir mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, sings there. And I know there's a strong charismatic movement as well. How do you deal with the diversity that exists in that area? Well, actually, Vince, um, when I was um, signed to this parish, uh, the first image that came to my mind uh, very fondly was uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Of and course. her appearance to, uh, this is not coincidentally, this is all divine providence. And this parish is uh, culturally diverse. We have, uh, of course, the English-speaking, Arifuna, uh, Spanish, Quechua, uh, uh, parishioners, uh, people, communities. And among the Hispanics, we have the, actually, I, I boast and say that the, the crib for the Hispanic charismatic is in my parish. Um, wow. And I've known them since I was ordained a priest, but coming to Belmopan is coming to the core of the community of the Hispanic. And I'm um, mm -hmm. very happy to be here to serve them and embrace all of them, especially uh, in the parish. One of my goals was to uh, unite the cultures, which we have been doing so far for the past five years. Mm. Father, I want to ask about the, the charismatic movement in Belize. Um, I know it has been received with some criticism from certain um, aspects of the, of the church. Um, you know, I, I have some familiarity with it. I used to attend uh, the annual charismatic conventions, and uh, it's, it's different from our mainstream type uh, Catholic, the way we, we worship, the way we do things. Uh, tell us about how this movement has been accepted by the church, or if it is or not. Sure, certainly. Um, thanks for visiting, raising this uh, important question, um, and I'm very happy to respond as the director of the Hispanic Charismatic been working with them for the past 10 years. Um, it started back in the uh, early uh, late 60s to early 70s, this charismatic movement. And certainly, I can say for sure, it has been accepted by the Catholic Church, Rome, all the popes, starting with uh, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, and all the other popes uh, after him have embraced the charismatic movement. Actually, our, our current Holy Father, Pope Francis, he speaks fondly and uh, has embraced also this uh, charismatic movement. He um, identifies with it as a, a grace-filled uh, movement, a renewal. And he's constantly called upon this uh, renewal uh, movement group to um, sanctify the work of the church through their service in their parishes and the church as well. Um, Working with them, I, I myself have, uh, I would say, uh, uh, helped me in my priesthood, especially in my prayer life, spontaneous prayer life, with uh, people in meetings, uh, school boards, and marriage council, and even parish has allowed me spontaneously to open up to the prayer and allow the Spirit to guide us, because we don't know how to pray on our own. We need the Spirit to help us to pray. Sure, it has been, um, it hasn't been widely accepted, especially among the clergy throughout the world. This is not only in Belize, throughout the world. 
And we do have some uh, clergy here in Belize that are still not open to this charismatic movement, which is officially and validly uh, accepted and embraced by the Vatican and the, uh, the Pope. I would say, I would say that all bishops and priests, by nature of their ordination, are charismatics. Mm -hmm. uh, the first apostles, they were all charismatics. Uh, they were the first ones to receive the, the gifts and the graces of the Holy Spirit during Pentecost. So we all flow, we all are descendants of the apostles, and we have that capacity to be charismatic, not just uh, uh, in the movement, but also throughout the life of the church. We are given the gifts and talents to be unique uh, witnesses to the gospel of salvation. Yeah, uh, thanks, Father. Uh, there sometimes is this perception that uh, people who are involved in a charismatic movement uh, are more spiritual. Uh, they really they experience the Holy Spirit and it manifests itself in some very uh, real and, and, and transparent ways, um, you know, unlike the others who would, would uh, just go to, to Mass and, 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 you know, the story sit and, and listen and maybe sing. Um, what is your take on that? Do you think they are more, they have a closer hand of God, uh, the charismatic folks involved in the charismatic movement? Uh, I will talk about the advantages and disadvantages in that aspect because uh, being among them and also being with uh, our Catholics also who are not charismatic, non-charismatic, yes. I would uh, be able to respond to that. First of all, the charismatic members are known in Spanish as servidores. Their servers, uh, because Jesus called us to be um, serve one another, mm -hmm. and certainly it's it's admirable their their um, all their life as a charismatic, and I constantly remind them that you're charismatic not just in, in retreats or gatherings, you're a charismatic every day. You wake up, you go to sleep, you wake up again, you are a charismatic. You are renewed every day by the Holy Spirit. They have a very deep spiritual life, first of all, uh, in uh, gathering in prayer. They do have weekly meetings where they spend time in prayer spontaneously, guided by the Spirit. And I know them as a very, very uh, close to the liturgy, to the Eucharist. Well, I would like to quote Bishop Christopher Glancy, who expressed to me that for him, the Charismatics are very loyal. They're very faithful to the Church. He said that his experience in Corozal, when he needed help, he would always turn to the charismatic group and are prompt and faithful to, to serve the church, the needs of the parish, he said. So the charismatics are very close to the church. And I remind them also that without their parish community, there's no charismatic. So they need to make lively. They need to be faithful to their parish, to their pastor as well, and to be involved in the life of their parish as well. In that way, they grow in their spirituality in uh, service to the church through their calling as uh, charismatics renewal. On the other hand, uh, the disadvantage of that, um, it's not that they are, uh, I would say, um, better than the, the, the non-charismatics. We're all the same. We're all the same body. Uh, Christ is the head. And we have different uh, gifts, uh, talents, uniques uh, to God and to our church as well. The only difference is that uh, I can say for charismatics that uh, they are faithful, they are very dependent, uh, speaking on my experience of both them, uh, and they're always uh, willing to, to serve the parish in, in whatever capacity they're able to do. You would always see them in church. Uh, Holy Redeemer, I can speak for that experience. Uh, they're always there. They're, every day they have something. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day they're in church. They are, are either having meetings, prayer meetings, they're having the, the, the service, the, which call the assembly, where they have praise and worship, they share a, a talk, a, a reflection, and so on. Thursdays, they never miss holy hour, even here and in the villages on parish, they always have adoration. Sometimes they have it throughout the day, from early Thursday morning to night. And so they're very faithful to the liturgy of the church. And that is a good way because it allows them to grow in their closeness to Christ in the Eucharist. They are able to be nourished in their faith and strengthened uh, in those difficult times that they need. Uh, that's where it, uh, the Eucharist in their life comes in very handy and uh, with full strength. 
uh, that was a way that they, they're being able to be seen. Uh, the, the, the charismatic members and the non-charismatic members, of course, we know them as they just go to church. Uh, sometimes they're just a Sunday uh, participants and we have a lot of them who are also weekly. There's actually no difference Catholics. Catholics, we're all Catholics. It's just the, Catholics. the yeah. name. It's just the name that is given to this movement, the, the charismatic renewal, uh, where they refer to, oh, you're charismatic. Yes, but I have my spirituality as a charismatic person. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a Catholic. Yes, I am a Catholic. I accept the church. I accept the teachings, the Eucharist, the sacraments. But basically, there's no difference. Just the, char the charism and the spirituality of the movement. Yeah, and, and it seems, Father, that the, 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 because of the commitment, because of all the, 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 the spiritual growth that takes place, indeed, uh, they would end up being more spiritual. Right. Um, thanks, thanks for that clarification. Um, you mentioned the, the charismatic, the Spanish movement. Um, do we have any other movements for non-Spanish uh, who would want to be involved in the, in the charismatic movement? Yes, uh, briefly, let me explain the Hispanic. The Hispanic began uh, more than 15 years ago here in the Copan, and it mm -hmm. extended to the rest of the country. But there was a, another group that started, uh, I believe, four, 40 years ago in Orange Rock. I remember as a child going to this uh, charismatic uh, events with my aunt, Eduarda, mm -hmm. in New Creek, and she would carry me. I remember going out there late 11 in the night. We returned back to our village. I remember the preachers come from Guatemala. So it has extended to the entire country. When I became the director, we didn't have communities like way into Bea Vista and Punta Gorda. Now we have all the way to Corozal. A lot of uh, communities are, are growing, are beginning to grow in this movement. We have now gone into the, e the Keys, uh, particularly San Pedro and Borgerski. We have gone in there also to do mission okay. on the charismatic movement. There is um, a movement in English, and it's led by Sister Alicia Budan. And they, they are there, um, they've been around for more, than, more years than the Hispanic. And they do also do charismatic, and they are, I think they're, they move from St. Ignatius Parish. They also have a Redeemer. I believe they're in other parishes in the, in the city. They also come to my parish. I have a few members here who are charismatic in the English movement. There are some in Orange Walk. Uh, throughout the country, I would dare say that we do have the English presence of the charismatic as well. We also have, I would uh, identify the, the other groups that are not uh, fully, I would say, under the name of charismatic, but they have do charismatic uh, spirituality and characteristics. Like uh, fondly, I remember the, the disciples of the Holy Spirit. Yes, they also yeah. have the, 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 that characteristic, which I'm very happy about them. And also mm. Mission Send Me. This is another group that uh, began some years ago. They also have charismatic uh, characteristics and qualities or spirituality, I would dare say. All these charismatic movements, I am in conversation with, uh, with uh, the, our bishop, Lawrence Nicasio. We would like to uh, bring them together. There's a, um, an international service, CARIS, in, in the Vatican. I've been in correspondence mm -hmm. with them, and we would like to sit down with all these coordinators, and we come together to work, to, to do the same work, under the charismatic uh, characteristics and mission in the church. And it seems like, um, you know, because of the, the, the way this movement brings people together and draw them closer uh, to, to church and, uh, and to the Holy Spirit, uh, it seems like that motivates you as a priest, I, I would think. That's right. I, I, I love to be around them when uh, we have retreats or events. Uh, even just stop by and visit the ones here in my, my parish. I see them regularly because I also go to do mass in the community um, mm -hmm. and in constant contact with them here, especially in the central. This is the central region of the Hispanic Charismatic. It uh, does have helped me. I know I receive uh, their prayerful support as well. I mm -hmm. always remind them to pray for their priests, for my mission as well as their, as their director, leading them, guiding them spiritually. And it does help... Um, the, the, the priests in the parishes, it ties um, uh, their work and allows them to be more confident to the people uh, in that capacity. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, Father, I know you're also involved with um, the, 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 the recruitment of vocation in, into the, the church, particularly 
uh, priests, uh, bringing priests into the church. Uh, I want us to touch on that on our next segment. Uh, you're watching Ask Your Father. We'll go to break. Uh, we're with Father, Father Gongor or Father Jordan. We'll be back. Welcome. We're back. You're watching Ask Your Father. I am your host, Vincent Palacio. And uh, of course, we're talking with Father Jordan. It's always a pleasure to be around Father Jordan. Thank you. When you used to be at uh, the Holy Redeemer Cathedral, uh, my wife and I used to follow you, you know, <laughs> when you used to do some masses, etc. So you do have a, a special place in our Palacio family, in our heart. Uh, Father, I'm talking now about vocations. I know every Mass I would go to with the Bishop, uh, Bishop Larry, uh, Lawrence Nicasio, uh, he would make a special intention, a special prayer uh, for more young people to join, to get into vocation. Uh, I know we talk the females into the, the, the nuns, nonhood and the, 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 the young men into priesthood. Uh, we want us to talk about the priesthood. Um, what would you say is the status of uh, our diocese today in terms of availability of priests and, and where are we with that? All right, yes, thanks uh, Vincent for that very important question as well for our people, especially the young people to hear this. We, right now, currently we have uh, seven seminarians for diocese. They are all studying to be priests for the diocese of Belize. They will become diocesan priests like myself. Diocesan mm -hmm. priests belong to the diocese. They are not, uh, they don't belong to a religious order. They belong to the diocese and they serve the diocese. They are not to leave the country, but they are to stay in the country to serve their own people, that's uh, diocesan priests. We have four right now in St. Louis, uh, last year. If you notice, we ordained uh, a man, one of them, Marcos Rodriguez, deacon. He's a deacon now. He's a transitional deacon. He, God willing, he'll be ordained next year, June, as a priest, and he'll be ready, one additional priest for the country to serve our people. Behind him is Mateo Salam. He will be ordained a deacon also in June next year, um, God willing. And after him is uh, two more seminarians, Emmanuel Medina and Shahir Pech from Corozal. Emmanuel is an orange rock. Mateo from Toledo, and Marcos is from uh, Valley of Peace in my parish here in Belmopan. With mm -hmm. me here in Belmopan, um, a, from January this year, we opened back the formation house, not in this seminary, but with me here in Belmopan as a Dawson priest to the seminary. I uh, took the initiative to take care of them, to guide them. We have three seminarians. We have David Trujillo from Secular Parish in Cayo, in San Ignacio. Uh, we have Gabriel Peck from Our Lady Guadalupe here in Belmopan, and we also have um, Fidel Mai from St. Ignatius, sorry, from St. Martin the Forest Parish in Belize City. And they mm -hmm. are studying right now uh, liberal arts at Sacred Heart Junior College. I would like to express gratitude to the Junior College in Sacred Heart for their willingness, their openness, and their generosity to host our seminarians uh, in that capacity to, stu to study there. I right now in their homes due to the pandemic, uh, we decided to close down the, the formation house and to, for them to be safe at home but, and all their classes online. I'm teaching them two courses online and I'm in touch with them as well. And from their, their homes, they continue their formation. They're still seminarians and I beg all of you to continue to pray for them in these trying times, the one in St. Louis and the ones here. I've been uh, very close to Bishop Larry in that aspect. Uh, serving in that uh, capacity as a caretaker and encouraging vocations as well, working in here and there in what I can to assist uh, the, the bishop in promoting vocations to the priesthood, especially in our diocese, to support them, follow up with them, and to uh, promote as well the priesthood in our diocese. Oh, good. Father, maybe you could explain to us uh, the process, because you, you, you talk about the the, 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 the how do you call the house, the, the seminarian house, or? Uh, it's a formation house. Formation house, yes. 
Um, when a young person expresses interest, how does that go? Um, you know, the, what is the recruitment process? If you could talk to us about it. Sure, so definitely. Recently, I received an email from a young man in Orange Rock who is interested. He said he wants to discern a call. All these guys, of course, they have to be eight years older to be able to discern. Uh, I start to talk to them. First of all, I ask them, can I get a, a, an official statement from you? Why would like to be a priest and so on? Then I start to entertain this, this uh, possible call. And they're invited to come over, meet with me and the other seminarians. It's like a come and see. They come and witness how the formation houses. The formation house here in Bemopan, we name it after St. Charles. Mayo. is closed for We hope to resume back in January. Uh, they're under my direct care here in Belmopan. The process is basically you just contact the office of the bishop and you will be referred to me and I will take care of that. We would uh, extend to you an application. You fill out the application, uh, submit the relevant documents that we best. Uh, then I call in for an interview. Then the young man is um, accepted or not, depending, and he is able to begin. He gets his official letter from the bishop uh, welcoming him that he is uh, uh, an official seminarian for diocese. Then he begins to study at Sacred Heart Junior College for a year or two years, maximum three years, depending on his qualifications. Then after that, they, we entrust them to Kendrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis, where the Archdiocese in St. Louis. It very, has been very generous in granting us a full scholarship for our seminarians. As it's very expensive mm. to, 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 uh, to study yes, abroad uh, as a priest as well, because they, they study to, to have master's degrees. And so they go there for four or six years, depending. And when they finish in six, seven years, they return. They're ordained a priest and they're ready to serve the people of God in their country. Wow. Father, Father before you go on, in terms of the recruitment, uh, would you sense a, a, a feel of, of desperation from the church to, 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 to um, accept or, or to, to recruit as many as possible? Uh, is there a return rate? Would people apply and not be accepted? Uh, uh, what is your, your thoughts on that? Or that's from, for the bishop office. Um, actually, it should be a separate uh, ministry and a separate, uh, I would say, office. The vocations office do exist in our diocese. Okay. Because of the lack of diocese and local priests take over different positions in the diocese, it has to be shared among us. and We have to stretch ourselves with these offices, for example, in my case. We don't have an official uh, vocation director who would be taking care of all this. I wouldn't have to worry about the seminarians recruiting and sending them to the seminaries and so forth. Uh, but I, um, given the situation, my last day is here in the diocese, not much has been done. Uh, I would say forcefully to promote vocations. Uh, and it's a very sad situation where mm -hmm. starting with the bishop and the priest, uh, not much uh, has been given uh, interest, I would say. Just few of us who are trying our best to promote vocations to the priesthood and even religious life. So I, I would uh, appeal to our Catholics, what can we do? Start mm -hmm. to pray for your priest, for your bishop, that they be strengthened, be inspired by the Holy Spirit, to be witnesses to young men out there who say, oh, I want to be a priest, like Father so-and-so, oh, Bishop inspires me, and so-and-so. That's what we need. And also, always, uh, our full Catholics can support vocations, so we don't uh, see desperate. Of course, our Lord says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. You pray, and you uh, assist in other ways, not necessarily uh, financially, Maybe here, here in Belmopan, my people, they donate groceries, they donate curtains, they donate uh, home household items to the house of formation. Not necessarily you have to donate money. But the most important one, which I will uh, greatly appreciate, is your prayerful support for our seminarians yes. and for vocations. Yeah. Uh, uh, Father, um, in terms of uh, the, the support, would you... You know, I have two sons. <laughs> you, you know, I have two boys. Uh, one is nine, will be 19 in another week or so, and the other is 16. And when they were younger, you know, we would, uh, you know, of course, have the conversation. 
because it would be their mother and my dream if one of them would accept mm -hmm. the call uh, to vocation. Um, uh, you know, when they would talk and say, when I get older, you know, my wife or my parishioners, you know, was kind of what they, they would, you know, at least have a chance there. And the, the parishioners part of the conversation is, is uh, slowly getting out of the picture, it seems. And uh, we, we do try our best to raise them in, 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 in the church. Um, so I want to think as parents, we're, what are we not doing, uh, you know, to, to attract these, uh, convince these young men to, to go into the priesthood? That's one. And, and second, Father, we have some Catholic high schools across the country. Uh, I know of maybe four. And when you listen to priests, um, you would often hear about uh, they kind of got interested when, uh, you know, the, 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 the teacher, a priest used to uh, teach them this particular subject in, in, this, uh, high, in high school. Uh, but then it seems like our high schools maybe are not touching where they need to touch to convince more of these uh, young minds to go into vocation. What are your thoughts on those two scenarios, Father? Sure, Vincent. Uh, first of all, John, C. John Paul II said that uh, we have uh, the families, the Christian families, are the domestic church. You're the first educators in your, of your children, mm -hmm. not the mm -hmm. teachers, you. And to foster vocations to the priesthood and just like, some way God knows who he has called, has chosen. Parents can be very instrumental in allowing their children to know this and discern or possibly um, to know that they are being called. In your case, Vincent, I, would, uh, I wouldn't be surprised given your, your um, deep spiritual life in your family. You and Rita and, uh, would encourage your children. Simple things, take them to mass, share the scriptures with them, uh, help them nourish, nurture their faith as children. And um, I would say, get them acquainted with the religious life. Um, maybe invite the priest over for dinner and that would uh, uh, inspire them. I used to be inspired by that when the priest used to go and have dinner at my aunt's house and I used to be right there. I was excited to guide the priest to, to my aunt's house. I would just sit and watch him eat. You know, I truly, I deeply remember that. that those are ways that you are inspired. Let them be servers. Let them be active in the youth group in their parish. Let them be active in serving or being lectors and so forth. That would uh, uh, foster their call if they're being called by God. Mm -hmm. Just kind of support all these, uh, these, these things uh, in your That's soul. That's right. What about the, the role of the high schools and, uh, and, and uh, you know, in, in the formation of these young minds? We have a lot of uh, potential in our high schools. We have several diocesan high schools, and we also have uh, religious high schools that are managed by religious orders. Mm -hmm. In both, we have uh, some that are fully women and some that are full men. Like yeah. St. John's, uh, Catherine's, and Paloti, they have great potential to promote vocations. I've, I've been around some of them, and I could say sadly that not much is being done. The uh -huh. principal or, or the administration or the campus ministry they're trying but a lot of the effort also comes from the staff and sadly some of our staff in those high schools are not interested or just just don't care plainly to, to promote vocations um, much has been influenced by society as well technology where our young people are more focused in making money rather than looking at serving our people serving uh, those who are immediate to them the, the local priests in that manner. Uh, so the high school is, is not doing much. Uh, very little is being done and it's not being done. Where I would see more force coming in is uh, to establish a youth ministry, diocese, and a vocation director who can go into the high schools and work with the staff, work with the campus ministry. This vocation director office is a uh, full time. It's, it's not a parish priest who can focus uh, mainly and prioritize on promoting vocation in high schools and even primary schools, I would say, in the center five and center six level. That, 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 is, that is true. Uh, and I also know, Father, that we have uh, quite a high percentage of our teachers in our Catholic high schools are not Catholics. 
how do we expect them to 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 to, to push our faith, uh, you know, no matter uh, in, in what subject area. And so our young people are not seeing um, uh, what they need to see to get to that discernment uh, point. Uh, again, it, there's a lot more to be done. There's a lot more to be done. Uh, and, and thank you for being, 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 being frank with us on, uh, you know, the role of the school and the role of the parents. Uh, what, are you, what do you think, Father, are some of the the distractors for young people from uh, answering the call. What do you think is, is, is drawing them away? For the last 10 years, I uh, technology in technology. so different ways have been bombarded by technology, uh, gadgets, um, into making business with technology. That is attracting tremendously a lot of our young people. And the cultural, the, I would say, to, to receive, to get, 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 and not to give of yourself. When I finished my sixth form, I decided to join the former Jesuit Volunteers Belize. It's a program that you give one year and you do service free. You don't mm -hmm. expect a pay or a stipend. I used to teach freely for a whole year. Who, who would do that for a whole year to teach and give yourself <laughs> freely? And many of my classmates say, oh, you're crazy. You're wasting your time. You know, you, you finish six farm go and make money but my mind was already set to be a priest and I, I that was a starting point for me that was a, actually a turning point to be able to know exactly to give myself freely to my people without expecting any, anything reward in return my reward is in heaven I, I work for that yes and, and so we need to do something here on earth as Jesus said uh, save your treasures yeah. in heaven <laughs> Grandfather, you're, you're, you're going uh, personal with this because uh, that is where I want us to go from here. To, to, how did you know um, that uh, you had the call and, and, and how did you pursue that, that calling? Uh, we go to break at the time. When we come back, we'll, we'll address that, Father. Definitely. Your, pastor, your father, we'll go to break. We're back. You're watching Ask Your Father with, with Father Jordan. Father, you left the last segment talking about your own uh, personal journey to becoming a priest. I want you to, 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 to expand on that. Uh, you know, there may be a, a young person who is watching or, or, or a parent who may need to advise their, their, their son as to what, what, what to expect and, and what it is. Tell us about your story. Thank you, Vince, for the opportunity to be able to relate to my own personal vocation. Uh, very rarely I do so. Um, a couple times when I'm around young people or when I'm asked, you know, I, I do relate. My mother says that I used to, when I was two, three years old, I used to show signs that I wanted to be a priest. I Honestly, I don't remember that, but she says that I used to, she... She does sewing. I used to make the, 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 the class that she doesn't use, and I used to put it on me. I used to buy Maria biscuits and play mass with my um, cousins and my siblings as well. They, I was very fond of priests. Uh, I used to go to church as a small. I used to rush the first pew and sit there and, and just observe the priest. She, she, they used to say that to me. But I lost this um, uh, interest to the priesthood in high school, particularly and growing you know, and coming to have peer pressure and stuff like that, of course you, you would be tremendously um, tempted and so forth in that aspect. But there was a point in my life, in my last year in high school, where my sister introduced me to Nassim Oscar Romero, and he ignited the flame of that call in, in my life. Up to now, I have deep devotion, love for Romero, that has led me throughout my seven, six years of formation in, in the seminary and has guided my priesthood as well uh, for the 11 years as a priest. Um, so there's always a turning point in a man's life where he's called. I remember going to the seminary the first semester. Um, the director said, here is a flight ticket return to your country. 
But then I stayed there and, you know, you pack up your things, you pack again. God has a way of calling and he will fulfill his calling. Anyway, it could be through a situation to a person. He calls you through, through something. Maybe God calls man in so unique ways and they respond gradually. If you're being called, time will, you will respond, time will tell, and God will certainly help you to respond your call. And so that has led me, uh, when I finished high school, uh, I went to Sixth Farm on my own. Then I went to that year of service as a judge volunteer. Then I met Bishop Martin, and he was very glad to send me to St. Louis. And that's where I went six years, returned to Zerdain in 2009, served at Fuller Redeemer for six years, and came to Bermopan, five years here in Bermopan, our Little of Cathedral, and can hopefully continue to service our people. You must finish high school first. Uh, at this point, you are invited to go to Sixth Farm Secret Heart, where they're gracious to grant a scholarship to our seminarians in, in Secret Heart College in San Francisco. Then you proceed to, to Kenrick's uh, Seminary in St. Louis. Mm. Father, when you started your, your, your journey in terms of seminary, going to school, um, was there any time of doubt that you, you, you figured, maybe this is not for me? Uh, yes, I, I was actually in a history diaconate year. I went into, a, I would say, two months uh, depression, and I did get assistance at the seminary. Uh, I would say more into a spiritual dryness. I had one of my close classmates who used to walk with me every day, check on me with this, because I was really down for those two months. Actually, it was during Lent that I went through a spiritual dryness. I was deeply doubting my all, and I almost left for college. But here I am. Um, God knows how to rescue. His uh, divine providence never sleeps. And it's always with us as well. Okay. All right. And, and it's often good to listen to that call, uh, Father. Uh, our, our young people are distracted these days, uh, you know, to listen, to listen to the call. And you mentioned earlier a big distractor in technology. And it seems that, especially yeah. now, this uh, pandemic where everything is online, it's, it's hard for, for this to be monitored. So our young people are, are constantly engaged. Uh, how will they find time to listen for this call? That's, that's the question I have. Absolutely. There, uh, there are ways that we can use technology properly. Uh, Pope Benedict used to uh, remind young people, use technology to evangelize. There are different ways. I'm very happy to see young people at Guadalupe meet. Some of them I do know in my uh, service to, to the parishes. And what comes uh, from technology is also temptations, perverse temptations. Um, you start to, to cut away from the grace of God in, in different ways, you know, where, where sin would creep in into the life of the young person uh, through technology. So it's, it's, it's good for them to know that, that technology could be good, especially in, in, good. You know, for our spiritual call. Uh, I, I use it quite a bit uh, to, to update myself on what is happening in the church, etc. So, um, indeed, it, it, it could be bad, but it could also be very good. Uh, good that we let our people know that. Um, so, if you have a young son, if, if you're young yourself, and maybe contemplating uh, going into the priesthood, uh, it, it seems that, you know, there is a way. And it's very doable here in Belize. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the three uh, vows that you, you have to do, we call it vows, uh, chastity, obedience, and, and what's the next one, Father? Poverty. 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 Exactly. Um, how have you dealt with those three as a priest? Because I'm sure uh, these young people are saying, ah. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead. Let me explain this, this uh, aspect of the vows. The religious orders and asasans have different vows. Mm -hmm. We almost have the same, but the, it changes honor with varies. Asasan priests, we profess uh, vows uh, permanently once. When we're in deacons, we, vow, uh, we promise vow of um, celibacy right away. We promise vow of uh, obedience to our bishop. And we promise vow of um, simplicity or uh, not much uh, poverty to our two different religious orders. Most of them have the obedience and 
poverty. We also have a, another vow that sends to pray the liturgy hours daily in our life for the church on behalf of the church as well. Okay. Um, so again, it's, it's something that is a part of the, the, the call, etc. Um, thank you for, for clarifying that. Uh, Father, it it's really has been a pleasure uh, hearing about uh, your story. Um, you know, who would you say was the greatest impact on your life when uh, in, in your formation or well, before you discern? You said a uh, priest used to come over and used to you know, enjoy being in their company. Is there any one person that you would contribute your work to? I would say uh, uh, there's many, not just particular one person. Okay. My aunt, my aunt, my mother, a uh, few priests I remember was Father Caetano, uh, Bishop Larry, who's a, a priest in Joac. Uh, Father, the late Father Curtis in Joac. So they were the ones who I used to be close as a child uh, mm -hmm. before going to the seminary. Um, so again, it's important as uh, young families, if you have uh, young kids, that you you invite the priest over, like, like like Father Jordan is saying, so our young sons could see and could interact with with, with, with uh, these priests. Because there, there are a lot of pressure. Sure. And you mentioned, Father, in high school, the pressure that you uh, had uh, when you kind of turn away somewhat. Because I, I see that I see that daily with both of my sons, uh, you know, the pressure mm -hmm. from... The, uh, their, 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 their classmates in, in high school, you know, to turn to pornography, to turn to all oh, that is not good. Um, you know, so it's important that we at home kind of put up a, 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 a strong force to keep our sons focused. Because if not, we could lose them. Certainly, that's, that's so true. Um, it's um, appeal to the parents not to... to uh, uh, I would say discourage them but to encourage them if they fall god is a god of mercy and, and there's another way how to date and continue with that yeah there's there's one last question i'll ask you to pray for for our audience here in, for viewers here in a few father um could you describe the charismatic family the charismatic movement um and how close they are uh to the church uh would you say that uh you know, more vocations could be coming out of these families? Yes, Vince, I feel to mention that they do have vocations come from those uh, uh, charismatic families. Uh, we have these priests who, who lived and, and they know the charismatic, for example, Father Alex Rodriguez from Las Fres, he's from Africa. We have a um, uh, Deacon Marcos Rodriguez, I remember him my first days as director. He was a, a servidor and he was very close to the charismatic as well. Our seminarians say Shahir Pepe, I invited him to our retreat in Baal and the ones here in Belmopan also, I promised them I would take them to our retreat for the charismatic movement so they're exposed and know their spirituality and the, the charisms of the charismatic movement. They do, they actually do tell them, let us pray. You are very close to, as a family, charismatic movement. And you have grace to 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 um, act with spirit and pray for more vocation. Even in our families, a lot of uh, youth groups that come from the charismatic movement. We have great potential. There. I'm sure God will will call one of them, just a sister or as a priest, diocese or any other religious order, country serving. Right. Um, it seems like I'm going all over the place here, Father. Please, please forgive me. Um, do you have any siblings, Father? What's that? Do you have any siblings, any brothers or sisters? Uh oh, we're gonna, we're oh siblings, to... sorry. Yes, I do. I, I have four, we're five, and, and they're close, and they do support my, my ministry, and they did support me during formation as well. Okay, yeah, that was, that was the question I was drawing at. Do you get support from your okay. own family at home? I do, I do. Because, you know, if, if, if one of my sons were to, to go on such a walk, I would be the, the, the proudest father I could tell you. So, again, the, the need for support. If, the, if, if your children are trying, are expressing interests, it's good that you support them. Because, you know, I hear parents talk about, oh, I want my grandkids and these type of talks. 
you know, we also need more priests. You know, we will die someday. We will need somebody to bury us. We, you know, uh, we'll need somebody to administer the sacraments to us. So uh, it's important that we encourage our young people. Um, Father, before we leave, I'd like to ask you to, to, to please pray for our viewers at this time. Definitely. If you're viewing, I would like you to close your eyes and uh, pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our return on High Priest. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in our church to sanctify, comfort, and console our church. We pray that as we listen to this dialogue, to this interview, may you instill in young people that call to serve you selflessly with joy and gratitude, your people. I beg you, Holy Spirit, to go to their hearts, to awaken the call to the priesthood and just religious life. We also bring to prayer all charismatic things, whether it is Hispanic or English. We pray that the Holy Spirit continue to inspire them, nourish their faith, sustain in these trying times. And for all our Catholic families, may we not lose faith and hope in the mercy, the love of God, the presence of freedom of us. May God bless us, protect us, continue enlighten us in the ways of truth, in the ways of faith and hope. Through intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe, may God protect our country, our people, our priests, our religious, and unite us in faith, hope, and charity. As is through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Jordan. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, interacting with you, hearing from you. And you're Thank you so welcome much, to come back to ask your father anytime. So if there's I would any, love to. any new initiatives that come up, Father, I know you're, you're a cutting edge priest. I, I followed your Eucharistic procession in Bamapan online the last time. So I, I knew exactly where you were at any, at any one time. I was very impressed with, with that whole uh, drive through that you did. Thank you, thank, thank you for continuing to uh, use technology in, in what you do. We're extremely grateful. Thank you. Um, Thanks, you guys. We would like to thank you for, for, for tuning in. Uh, we would like to thank a, a special sponsor uh, this, this, for this show, uh, Mrs. Patricia Rickenia. Uh, Mrs. Rickenia uh, is a proud sponsor. She's 80 years old, and she supports the work that we do at Guadalupe Media. I'd like to in, in, invite those of you who may want to sponsor to contact our office and uh, at the uh, contact information that you'll see on the screen and uh, support, support the work we do. Thank you. You are watching Ask Your Father. I'm your host, Vincent Palacio. See you next time.